I originally got the insane idea of doing a documentary on the New Orleans underground music scene. My initial intentions were really just to cover a specific scene that existed from the early 90s to the mid 90s with about a dozen bands or so that all started and ended around the same time and then take it up to present and show sort of how the scene's happening in this day and age. But the more and more I looked it seemed that there were two pretty influential bands that had an impact on that scene in the 90s and still to this day. Uh, that at the time were, were, were pretty unheard of and pretty unnoticed. Uh, one of which was the Black Problem, who three quarters of the members went on to form the band Lump, who luckily I had video footage of because after a year of looking I never could find Black Problem footage. And then of course the Nipples of Isis. And the Nipples of Isis, like the Black Problem, were really just two oddball bands that didn't fit into any scene or, or really any genre and were just sort of outsiders on the whole music scene. And I think the main contribution of both of those bands was that they influenced just a handful of musicians that went on to, to form that scene in the 90s and still, you know, play music to this day. All lawn jockeys and Dish Skatey One gonna come to life and go eat David Duke alive. Oh. Suck my dick and call me daddy Me and my friends uh, used to also go see this band called The Black Problem, who, once again, still to this day, there's no band around here that's ever matched the power 
and fucking energy laid by that band. Um, they were surely, you know, after seeing them a couple of times, I just, I just knew that that was what I wanted to do. It was just real people having fun and just awesome, you know. I just wanted to. I never missed a show, and I, I really felt like I belonged somewhere. Really, for the first time, you know, ever. It was like uh, the coolness that you experience, you know, taking drugs. I started taking drugs and seeing killer bands and I thought, well, this is really what life is all about. Problem had this shit where they were kind of like the Minutemen, but kind of like no means no. But they had these fucking super catchy songs, not like stupid, like Green Day catchy or like you know that pop punk catchy, but real fucking jamming, super fucking just real upbeat, exciting shit that was fucking just totally vicious, real vicious shit. And that was the Black Problem, and no one's touched that shit ever since. What a best gigs that they ever played was at this uh, laundromat on Magazine Street and it was a Halloween party and uh, they had candles all over the place and s people are sitting on the washers and there was even a young woman who uh, tried to ride in one of the dryers only she had her purse in there with her and all the contents came out and she was screaming as the uh, makeup and pins and mirrors and stuff were flying around and hitting her okay but this is a really cool show and and something very memorable. Yeah, when we first started, uh, we didn't fit into any of the scenes. There weren't that many scenes, but there was like the hardcore scene, which was a little bit, you know, just wasn't our our take. And uh, the dash rip rock scene, and we weren't really into that. So there was really kind of a lack of a band, a big band, that a local band that you wanted to open for. Like, oh, I wish we could open for you know this band. It was more. A lack of that, we you know we, we had a lot of bands like from SST bands and stuff that would come in from out of town that we would love to open for, but uh, it w really wasn't like a, a trademark, a landmark band for the local scene, you know, for the type of music we wanted to play. Basically, we were a hardcore band and uh, playing with a band like On, who was uh, you know more into like Traffic and Pink Floyd sound. And <laughs> Captain Meathead was, you know, uh, kind of a se semi-retro blues funk James Gang kind of thing. We took a break from Black Bomb because we were feeling a little bit stagnated and kind of running in the same circles and not really getting anywhere and not getting where we wanted to get musically or success wise and uh, after a while we got together uh, really the same guys from the Black Problem but without the original guitarist Dave Anderson because we wanted to get into bringing that improvisational element into our music a little more and do jazzier things which um, kind of wasn't what he was into.
between your pink eyes suckling pig. I'm so little and you're so very big. Your heavy cream drifts off the hair of my chitty chin chin. My cop runneth over and over again. the gigs would get very physical and you would dance with people and it would get very physical and you'd be rolling around on the floor and all this like you know green and brown glass from all the beer bottles and everything and, it, and that happened more than once at these lump gigs you know you would just you you throw yourself into the moment and when you throw yourself into the moment really great you know really fun things can happen and that happened a lot at those gigs I remember one Mardi Gras, I saw Nipples of Isis play at Checkpoint, and it was just uh, explosive. I, th I believe it pretty much changed my life in a lot of ways, you know. And, uh... of sort of a coagulation of all these bad experiences mixed with the ecstatic experiences simultaneously. Hey, the nipples, first time I saw the nipples, I was on about three hits of acid and everything was cool until I saw the nipples, you know? Because this bitch came out Okay, they open for helmet. Was, it, well, was that the RC Bridge Lounge? Yeah, RC Bridge Lounge. Oh, shit. And Squishy, the goddess that is Squishy. And it, those in the know, you know who I'm talking about. Squishy and Jane. Jane. Anyway, Squishy came out and she had candles on her breasts, lit, burning her nipples, man. And they were playing this god awful fucking psychedelic fucking music that <laughs> was like yeah that's what I'm talking about because it was like King Crimson on P PCP you know it was it was trumpets galore it was bright it was glory it was sex it was fucking drumming from hell Chris was fucking amazing you know the hottest Catholic school girl drummer bitch you ever met I mean he, he was fucking awesome they were amazing musicians who weren't, in the beginning, they weren't taken very well by the city who was used to being pummeled by metal.
with AP Gonzalez, uh, our first show, uh, out at the Abstract Cafe or a bookshop or whatever it is. And um, it seemed to really propel things forward. It gave it uh, some form of uh, legitimacy. And uh, after that, all these songs really uh, took on more meaning and they took on their own character and we developed our own writing style. And uh, I think it was uh, probably the catalyst that brought in Mitchell Nevado, who was the lead singer and trumpet player and uh, random percussionist. <laughs> and uh, from there, he uh, recruited Chris Wassel, because uh, AP Gonzalez, uh, I don't think we had enough funky flavor for him. So, <laughs> so we, uh, we got this uh, crazy hedonist named Chris Wassel, and he, uh, he started on a uh, little Fisher Price drum set and um, turned into a uh, drumming rock god. So, what else can I say? And then, of course, later on, you find out that they're all shooting heroin. And then, of course, then when there was no heroin in town, they would all shoot random pharmaceuticals. Haldol, which is not water soluble. So, one night they're shooting Haldol, they have to go to the hospital. We're supposed to play a show, but they have to go to freaking charity because they've shot a non water soluble chemical into their veins and they're having some kind of reaction and there's bubbles under their skin. And I'm like, so. Uh, what do we do now? Basically, I guess, uh, fold or we just get new band members? Well, that's not exactly possible because then, you know, you lose that particular flavor and people always, you know, it's not the original lineup, man, you know, so why go? Even though no one went anyway. <laughs> but, so, uh, as this is all exploding, I'm sitting there feeling very despondent over things. I'm not really into sticking needles in my veins and my, uh, I would say boyhood kind of friend, Sean, I've been friends with him for over 10 years, winds up being a speed freak and I had no idea of this. He's shooting hair, I mean, I'm sorry, shooting speed with his girlfriend and they're financing our recording by selling speed and I'm not understanding why or how I got involved in this. And at some point you just have to go, waiter, check please. <laughs>of a New Orleans music scene uh, came about when I was in junior high school and I started going to the Abstract Cafe, which is on Magazine Street, um, just a block or so away from the RC Bridge Lounge, which had a scene of its own. It was just cool to be able to go to this old garage behind, you know, this, this bookstore, cafe place and, uh, you know, go up in there where there was no security and, you know, there was this little crappy old PA, but all these cool bands had come out and, and you know, for me and for a lot of people, I think it was actually pretty inspiring to see these guys rocking out like that at, at you know, my age, which was 15 at the time and even younger. And, uh, you know, there's no security at these shows, so the crowds were crazy. There were bands like Dang Bra Y, Fiddlehead, Scab, Dr. La La. And uh, in some of those cases, some of those members went on to form bands like Rigid, Suplex, Spickle, Hostile Apostle. Uh, Hogjaw is another one of those bands, and in some of those cases, some of those members' roots extended to uh, a scene that existed at the old VFW Hall uh, prior to the Abstract Era with bands like Graveyard Rodeo and Exhorter, and you know, those were the reigning kings of that hardcore scene at the time. It was completely wild. People were hanging from the ceilings, climbing up the walls. And where was it? The Abstract yeah. Bookstore and Cafe. A little bookstore with like a garage in the back with a stage in it. No lights. There was like one light bulb hanging from the ceiling. We had uh, utility lights, like yeah. like uh, heating lamps from uh, like you would put on your uh, on like on a water pump or something. That's what we had for, for lights. So we had run out of VFW halls, American Legion, and other type venues. Uh, we were lucky enough that Judge Byrne was able to uh, allow bands to pay at the abstract, though this was uh, an all ages and uh, no alcohol venue. But just by chance, the Bridge Lounge was down the street and Chuck let people uh, do shows there. And that was the great thing, was the whole uh, laissez-faire attitude of Chuck and other bar owners, is they just let us do our thing. You know, Chuck would say, uh, you got a guitar? Is it the kind that plugs in? 
Well, then you know what to do. And these were true multimedia events. We had also Aswell's Psychedelic Light Show there, and uh, dancers such as uh, Squishy and uh, Lilith Rochon, who worked Nipples of Isis. And uh, even, you know, I, I hate God, Mike Williams breaking glass all over the place. I, I guess that counts as some kind of performance art. We played, uh, there's a band from Virginia called Born Against. I've, I've seen the shirts. Right. And uh, RC Bridge Lounge, which was another really cool club that oh, yeah. lasted for a while. Gigi yeah. Allen played there. Yeah. Fucking. Uh, Helmet played there. Yeah, first Helmet, show right, exactly. On. Exactly, you know, it's just, just I mean, you know, play crazy shows. fucked up club, you know, right. I mean, fit the music and everything. Anyway, we're supposed to play with this band Born Against, you know, I hate God is, so our, uh, I forget the reason we couldn't play because uh, somebody was out of town or something like that, so we couldn't do it as a band, so we, uh, a couple friends, of ours, we went to fucking Superstore, got like 30 pounds of cow fat. Mike Williams went to the, like this garbage can, found like these bunch of plate glass. We showed up with a tape recorder, a fucking sledgehammer, all his fat masks, guitar, and, and it was like, we just did like this noise show, broke all this glass, destroyed the club, and basically, and left. And that band, Born Against, was like so pissed at us for years. And we finally met those dudes, and then, and, and, uh, like recently, and they, and they were just like, it was just fucked up. But I mean, that's like, it was fucked up what we did, you know, it was totally fucked up. We were wasting, nobody knew what the fuck was going on. We were throwing, throwing fucking fat at people. There's glass <laughs> everywhere, dude, everywhere. There was a battle of the bands, I will never forget this. There was a battle of the bands at RC Bridge Lounge. It was like uh, Phil Anselmo from Pantera. Captain Meathead played, and then another band played, and another band played, and they had like some, you know, weird, like, sadistic acupuncture, mud slinging, crap slinging shit going on stage, and women taking off their breasts and eating each other out, and all this kind of crazy stuff. And then, right, then comes Phil Anselmo, like, sitting on the stage, could barely get up on the stage, could barely hold his guitar, plays like about three or four songs, and he decided he was going to show off his guitar playing, because he don't hardly ever play his guitar. Picks up his guitar, starts to do this solo, and then looks up at the crowd, and then proceeds to throw up all over his shirt and all over his guitar, all over himself, and then just stopped playing. And just it was just the most hilarious thing I've ever seen in New Orleans music. I think to see that to see the leader of Pantera like puke all over himself. God, those were the fucking days. Chuck from RC actually made that scene. I think blossom and flourish in the early days. Um, there was no place for us to play. We're playing at the abstract of all things, you know. We had a good time. They uh, promoted their own selves. They put out their own flyers. They paid for all their own advertising. Uh, they were doing damn good. And then for some reason, the uh, the area didn't like the style of music. So in '94, uh, I think about last year, we had music. Uh, Myself went to jail three times for possession of bands, and uh, it was kind of interesting, but it was a shame that our city and, and the government's got to do that for music. They murder music. They won't let new people have a chance to make their mark. They want all the other people that been around, that died, or about to die, now they're making them famous for their type of music. They're denying the young people their opportunity. That's basically what I feel. I came up here to 1179. We renovated the space, and I too was uh, raided by the police the first night that we did music. Um, they arrested me and told me I didn't have a sign permit, um, that I didn't have uh, uh, occupational licenses that weren't correct. So it was a heavy handed introduction here to doing uh, a show. We did brass bands on Friday nights and then on Saturday, night, Saturday nights we usually would do a show that featured lump, nut, rigid, uh, AGB.
band at the time was Weed Eater. Uh, I really, really enjoyed those guys. Weed Eater blew my mind, actually. I, I saw those guys uh, once at uh, Monaco Bob's, or I think it was Warehouse Cafe at the time, and uh, I knew Jason and Brent and uh, I saw their band and it just totally blew my mind. I, did, I, I didn't know that people were playing that kind of music. That was a huge influence on me and my band, was going to see them. about the eating of the week. All right, there was a there was a burn version tour that was about three weeks long, and the first day of the tour we were in at Atlanta, and um, I had a friend that I went to high school that lived out there, and he gave us this giant bag of weed. It was it was over a quarter. It was good weed, wasn't it? It was good weed, but it was free weed, and it was the first day, so we were like, we're leaving town. We did this gig. It was all right, whatever. And uh, we're partying, having a good time. We're leaving town and we stoned, drunk. We go, oh, we got a giant bag of weed and all. We're on the interstate for like 10 minutes. Mark was driving. And uh, this, the fucking cop turns his lights on. And we're like, oh, man. So it was me and the singer bass player guy, James Marler, sitting in the back. And Bob, was the guitar player, was sitting in the front passenger seat. And he had all of these joints in this little this little receptacle kind of thing and me and James Marlin are in the back so James Marlin and I starts eating this weed just tons of fucking uh, this big bag of just good weed that it was like it was either that you know we get pulled over they take the gear they arrest us they do everything so James Marlin and I eats all of this weed in like fucking 20 seconds if you gotta like if you gotta time it out it's about 20 seconds we eat all of this big bag of weed we 
fucking chugging it down with water. We swallowing sticks, and it was it sucked. But anyway. <laughs> Why didn't so, you eat the weed, Mark? I was driving. He was driving. He was, I was driving. He was you driving. Can't drive any weed at the same time. I warned him. I said, "Look, amateur. y'all, there's a cruiser behind us. He's just been, he's been following me for about five minutes. Get that shit out and be ready to eat." And like ten seconds after I said that, the lights come on. I'm like, "Start eating!" We pull over, and they did it. Bob had to eat the joints. <laughs> but the thing was, which was the worst. The thing, it was like eating hay. He's like tearing it off thing, with his teeth. It but the thing great. was, is like we eat all of this big bag of weed, and Bob's eating all of these joints, and the cop comes, looks all over the fucking van, checks out all the gear and shit, and then we're like, oh, that sucked. We had to eat all of that weed, and then we're driving off, and Bob drops one of the joints right on the fucking console of the van, so there's a fucking joint just sitting out with a fucking ribbon on the motherfucker, and we eat all of this shit and go through all of this shit to get through this, and there's a fucking joint right open, <laughs> right out in the open. Yeah, and we would try to do uh, out-of-town shows and tours and stuff, but um, we were cursed, it seemed. Every time we would try to get out of town, we'd spend $600 in the month before we were going out of town to get the van fixed up just right and finally fix these nagging problems that it had. And sure enough, before we'd hit the Mississippi state line, something else would go wrong with it. We'd be on the side of the road calling, trying to borrow money to get the van fixed. It was, it's the curse of jazz because... Uh, even as now we speak, I'm, I'm thinking about writing for this new local magazine that's coming out because they brought one to me to ask my opinion and I gave them both barrels. I was like, you, we really need some more about jazz and R&B here? I mean, how many times can I see you know black and white glossies of the Wild Magnolias? I'm sorry, I'm bored. So we don't get any focus on local music, therefore there's a dis- disjunct scene. There's tons of bands. But no one knows about them, and no one goes to the shows, and so what happens? They go, well, nobody's watching, and I can't make no money, so I'm going to become a service industry worker. It definitely does not have to do with a curse. It has to do with the losers that live in the city, that come to the city, that hang out in the city. To be losers. That come to our shows. Don't Some, give them drugs. I'm not, no one's interviewing you people. The, 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 the fact that people come out 
on nights where any normal pe people would be doing something uh, productive with their lives. It's ridiculous. It's the silliest place I've ever seen, and the Saints lose because people are losers around here. Not because of a curse. You can fucking build a Superdome on top of my grandmother, who isn't dead yet, but I guess one of them is. is. You can build it specifically on her grave, and I can say, Grandmother, curse them. You know, on your way to the grave. <laughs> Just curse them and, and lay it on. And let me tell you what ain't happening. That. It's a place you can always come back to. You got uh, uh, a mama always there. It's not the big easy, it's the big tit. It's some place you can always come back to and just suck right on to it. And no matter what you do, no matter how far you fall, there's nobody that's going to ever make any, any, any situation bad for you about that. It's, it's, it's the greatest place that you can come to as long as you don't want to win. And as long as you don't want to win, you've got this place here as a, as a paradise. I don't fit in anywhere, man. I really don't. I don't agree with anything either. Not even what I just said. So I think you see the fucking problem here. Fucking problem here.
But they were awesome, man. That was awesome, man. Mike Ogden, Ray. Those motherfuckers were bad. <laughs> Those guys went on to do some some crazy shit. Uh, one of the members was arrested running down the street naked on acid. Uh, I think one, if not a couple of the members were arrested uh, for having quote unquote pornographic images on some of their flyers. Uh, and the craziest story of all about those guys is that uh, their original singer ended up uh, quitting the band when he became a born again Christian. And then uh, about four and a half years later or so, the guitarist ended up leaving the band, which broke it up over becoming a born-again Christian. So they lost not one, but two members to Jesus over the course of a few years, and surely no other band in New Orleans history has had something so ironic like that happen to them, I'm sure. So we were all about buffets, hay bras, monster trucks, naked chicks, whatever, you know? That was pretty much what our... Our social influences would definitely be those things. All you can eat buffets, man. I mean, you can't fucking beat that, you know? <laughs> and there's nothing like a naked chick with Coke. Jesus. <laughs> and here we are fucking their brains up, you know, with fucking naked guys in cow suits, their dicks hanging out, you know, chicks dressed in plastic, you know? They couldn't deny it, they knew it, they fucking knew it. For me, what made that time so much fun was, uh, I don't want to call it a scene, but with just the group of bands that were all playing at the same time and in the same clubs, and even, you know, earlier with Black Problem and then later uh, in the early 90s with Lump, there wasn't any competitiveness between the bands. Everybody was just friends and nobody worried too much about, well, who's opening for who or who's going to get to play this or that or how long anybody plays. It, it was always just, uh, and it wasn't any kind of um, discrimination as far as, oh, well, they play this type of music, you know, and they play another type of music, so we can't play together. A lot of these bands, you know, my brother's band, which was Weed Eater and Evil Nurse Sheila and Burn Version and, and uh, Lump were the bands that were playing a lot at that time, they, they shared bills a lot and not always with the same combination of people because it was a really community type of thing happening at that time. The best part was the diversity of music and the brotherhood of the musicians involved was unlike any other time that I could that I remember or have heard or will probably yet to see in New Orleans music. And the sad part being went highly unrecognized uh, in literature and media, things like that. But the real deal being selling out clubs every time you played, you know. But uh, New Orleans is all about heritage music, 
which is a great thing. I don't deny it. As a drummer, I, I'm, I'm definitely into it. But as a musician, I was very turned off by it, I'd have to say. Because, yeah. because it was. It was part of a last wave of original bands made up predominantly of local players and of their statement, of their impression of what the world is before. In many cases, as I've discussed with many friends of mine, I mean, it was like when Ellis became head of UNO School of Music and Daniel Lanois opened up the, school, the, the studio on Esplanade, was the beginning of this sort of a, a renaissance to some, <laughs> uh, an invasion to others. Oh, it's just cool bands getting together and nobody going any place. Yeah, nobody, could, none of these bands could actually get on the fucking radio. You just got loaded and went to the gig and hope you didn't fuck up. Everybody kept getting better and better and the only people that cared were the people like playing in those bands. It was great though. But it was there were so many bands fun. though. You had, you had a oh, nice yeah. crowd. Always had a crowd. Because you always had the same fucking bands hanging out. And most of them owed you money or I owed them money or I was living with them or they fucking stole my weed or <laughs> it was a it was I just like how everybody played with everybody else so you could change it up any kind of bill like that yeah. bring out all the same people yeah. and suddenly you're in a place and this place is full of what I call uh, self dribbling jeweled basketballs <laughs> I think there are aliens, but I think they can only reach us through our mind, through our mind. say, hey man, when are we going to jam? When are we going to form a band? Come play with me. And I had my thing going on, which I thought was cool at the time. Uh, I didn't know that he was so persistent that he called me pretty much every day and he started calling me at work. And so we got to hanging out. We liked a lot of the same music and we pretty much hit it off right off the bat. It was a struggle after that to find a bass player. And uh, then I had the idea to call the guy that was uh, the Oxen Thrust bass player shortly before that band dissolved, uh, Rolando. I didn't really know him very well, but knew he was a pretty good bass player. And uh, that's how we started. We just drill it out at a, a friend's house in Metairie. We had a practice spot in their garage for a couple of months until a neighborhood petition banned us from practicing there.
if if I choose to work seven days a week, I don't want to be whipped. Oh. Because God said in his word, he said, Well, you know how to feel up the sky. thought that we were doing something good and that you know we're kind of on a mission to just keep on doing despite outside influences and you know basically fuck everybody I didn't give a fuck about anything except for making good songs and writing the kind of music that we could really jam to you know I often I often look back and go you know is there any way that a rock and roll band can make it out of New Orleans? And I think that it's probably next to impossible if it's not respected. In a town like New Orleans where people consider it to be a music town, it's not New York. It's not a place where, where uh, differences are welcomed. So what are you going to do then as a, as a rock and roll musician in a roots music town? You keep hitting a wall, the wall don't break, you know, it's like, fuck it, you know, you know what you're doing is good. Carry 